been heard already this morning about coming higher, coming higher, a place of relationship with the Lord, uh, an upper room experience uh, with the Lord. Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. I've been in that uh, off and on for quite a long while now and uh, just wanting to lay hold of, of the reality of it experientially. Just want to walk in it. Uh, we don't want to just accumulate theology and, and say, oh, well, I, I, I want to get a perfect, true, accurate theology and then I'll be okay. Well, uh, theology is okay up to a point, but... <laughs> Once you have your theology, you need to walk in it. So uh, I want to be a partaker experientially of what we are hearing. In Romans 8, and we're going to break into this marvelous context uh, in the first 14 verses, and we'll start with verse 8 to begin our exhortation this morning. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And let me just inject this in my own words. You're in the Spirit if the Spirit dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, Putting in another word here, although the body may be dead because of sin, the spirit is alive or life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or give life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you, by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And I see this as an ongoing impartation of his life to our faculties, not just our physical body. That's the way I see it. It may have an application to our physical body, and we know that the Lord heals, but I believe there's more than that implicated here because of the context that uh, he wants to quicken our entire being, bring life to all that we are, to our minds, to our heart, to every faculty of sp spiritual faculty, our eyes, our ears, our heart, our sense of smell, our sense of touch in the spirit, all that may uh, comprise us. Therefore, brethren, in view of this, therefore, brethren, verse 12, we are debtors. The meaning there is we have an obligation. We have a responsibility. You know, we don't like to do that. We like, we like to hear that God will do it all just automatically. But folks, the news is that God won't do it all automatically but he requires our cooperation. That's why the charge here, that they are, that are in the flesh cannot please God. He's not talking about the world here. He's talking about Christians, believers, who may be still governed by the flesh. Is that possible? Yeah. Romans 6, also the same thing there. To whom you, you saved people, to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you become, whomsoever you obey. So we still have the capability of, of yielding to the flesh and becoming people who walk in the flesh. Therefore, we are debtors. We have an obligation not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Certainly not. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Well, see, there it proves that he's not talking to the world. 
He's saying, you believers, if you allow the flesh to take over, you're going to die. You who have been made alive are going to die. And that, there's a lot earlier than this. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life. But if you, through the Spirit, you believers, you through the Spirit, do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. Praise the Lord. You shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And the word there is the mature sons of God. God's looking for mature sons of God. And we could put it this way, as many as are governed by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, led by the Spirit, governed by the Spirit of God. This is the kingdom. This, this is the root and the foundation of the message of the kingdom. What is the kingdom? It's the rule and reign of Christ. Being governed by the Lord Jesus rather than by Self. Isaiah spoke about our predicament. He says, all you like sheep have gone astray. You have all turned to your own way, but now you've returned to the bishop and shepherd of your souls. And so, this passage, as well as many others, sets before us a picture of the overcoming life of the believer. There is a lifestyle that God would have us to enter into. We've heard of it already this morning in, in other terms. There's a level up here that Brother Jeff was talking about that we can live in. The pressures of life, and of course Satan's behind that, is to push us down. Samson said, if I, my hair is cut, I'll be like every other man. Or we could put it this way, if my consecration is tampered with, destroyed, nullified, if my consecration to God, if that which has made me a Nazarite is interfered with and, and reversed, then I'll be like every other man. And as our brother has said, saints of God, sanctified, set apart. We, we haven't been called to just be like the people of the world, only maybe cared for by God and blessed by God, and one day when we die we have eternal life. But we are called to live an overcoming life. To be governed by, not by our sinful nature. If we're governed by our sinful nature, that's equivalent to walking in the flesh. If we walk in the flesh, we shall die. But if we mortify the deeds of the, of the flesh, we shall live. So we have a responsibility. But this morning... I want to start there by showing uh, us the, the goal. The goal is a life governed by the Spirit. Governed by the Spirit. A life that, whereby we can walk in the Spirit. We are charged to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Uh, John, uh, the, the Gospel of John, I'm sorry, the letter to John puts it like this in the first chapter. Let me find it here. 
He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he, Jesus, walked. We need to walk as he walked. Now let's look at Jesus for a couple of minutes here. Let's look at Jesus. He is our example, and he is our pattern. And I want to start with the prophecy that went forth concerning Jesus. Will you please now turn to Isaiah chapter 11? And we're getting a slow start here, but Lord help us here as we... uh, try to unburden our hearts and and share with you. You know, folks, the ministry of the God's Word is not easy. And every time I stand up here, I feel, not not necessarily from you, but I feel pressure, opposition. And it's, it's principalities and powers that don't want the Word. They don't want the truth to be heralded, to be given out. And it's not, it's not easy. We feel that pressure. Uh, so, you know, as, as you're, we go through a, a message, just whisper a prayer to yourself, or in your mind at least, oh, God, help us this morning. God, help us this morning. But uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 11, in Isaiah chapter 11, the prophet saw uh, a, a picture here of what Jesus would be like. And here's what he said. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. It's obvious it, has, it refers to Jesus. And here's what he's, he went on to see about Jesus. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. I was talking with Steve Wilbur last night. Just felt to. Right in the middle of my study, the Lord said, Brother Wilbur has something that will uh, fit in to what you're you're studying. And it was just a wonderful time. Uh, Brother Steve plans to come here to the retreat. And uh, he's just a lifelong friend that's just so full of the Lord and of truth that he just bubbles over all the time. Praise the Lord. Thank God for Steve Wilbur. God bless him and and Roberta. And Lord, we pray that you will open up a door of ministry for them. Amen? Amen. They are so precious. They are just rare jewels in the kingdom of God. And he said to me, he said, uh, you know, he said there's two there's two types of movements or, or two types of expressions in the spirit. One is bombastic-like. It's just kind of like an explosion. And all of a sudden, the spirit of the Lord comes in and rests on people, and boom, they're off, they're prophesying. Thus saith the Lord. And there's a, you know, a, 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 an outburst, like a geyser. We visited Wyoming, the, the geyser that spouts out every 30 minutes, right on... Uh, right on time. It's amazing. The guy says, this thing spouts up every 30 minutes. And so there's that kind of an anointing that every once in a while people, they'll give a word or something that is just outstanding. It's just like uh, an outburst of life. Power. That's okay. That's wonderful. But he said the higher form is an overflowing cup. It's likened unto an overflowing cup. Did you ever put a cup under the faucet and you leave it there too long and it overflows? It overflows. And you, you maybe you don't hear much, but here's this cup overflowing, 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 and all this water's going out. He says, that's the higher where the Spirit of the Lord is just flowing out from a person all the time. Wow. 
What a challenge. What a challenge. All the time. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. He, just hold your hand in that and look with me in John chapter... Uh, hold your hand in that because we'll come back to it. But in John chapter 1, I believe it is, uh, it's interesting that of the three writers who, who write about the baptism of Jesus by John... Uh, John the Apostle here brings out something that the other two do not. And here it is in John 1.32. John 1.32. And John bear record, that is John the Baptist bear record saying, now watch this, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. rested on him. It didn't just come down and flicker a little bit and then jump away right away. It abode on him. And he goes on to say, And I knew him not, but he that sent me, this is John the Baptist talking, he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Now, I don't, I don't believe the dove remained all three years on him. <laughs> but the Spirit of God was always hovering over Jesus and his, his actions and his speech and his walk and whatever he did. He was one who walked in the Spirit. He was never out of the Spirit. Are we, are we getting the picture? He was never out of the Spirit. He didn't, well, he had occasions when, of course, he had a word by the Spirit or he did something spectacular by the Spirit, but he was never out of the Spirit. Can we say amen to that? He was never out of the Spirit. Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. He's the one. And we've seen spiritual movements come and go. We've seen the Spirit come from the beginning of the last century on into the latter, ha latter part of that century, the Pentecostals. And in the early Pentecostals, the Spirit was very much in evidence. These people would be charged with the Holy Spirit, speak words uh, uh, in the Spirit, uh, do simple things, yet powerful things. The moving of the Spirit was very real in early Pente Pentecostal days. But the time came as man stepped in and began to organize and make alterations and put restrictions and all of this, limitations and all that, that man squeezed out the Spirit of God. And in 1954, when I went to England, I found the church denomination that I was born in was now a dead church. It was dead. The Spirit was gone. And we can say the same with other Pentecostal denominations. Death came in. And we've also seen individuals that were once vibrant, powerful, with great gifts of the Spirit. And we've seen, we watched their lives, and I saw one on television years ago, and I looked upon him, and I, and I saw death in his countenance. Oh, my God. Ichabod had to be written. The glory of God is departed. In the early years of America's founding, there were great institutions 
raised up in the Northeast. Those that we call the Ivy League schools today, Princeton, Dartmouth, uh, Harvard, and such, they were raised up by Christian people. They were Christian schools at once upon a time. And I don't have to convince you when I say that there's been a terrible turnaround for the worse in these institutions. They've been, now become hotbeds of liberalism in our country. The spirit has departed. These are days when I am hungry for more of the spirit. Not satisfied with an experience I had when I was 11 years of age, when I, re, when I got baptized in the Spirit. I can't live by that, though I appreciate it. I can't live by that. And I asked this question to Brother Wilbur so that I would not be exalted or, uh, or just prideful and come out with something. I said, Brother Wilbur, can we experience a loss of the Spirit? And he immediately said, oh, yes. <laughs> you know, brother, those of you that know Brother Wilbur, oh, yes, it happens all the time. So that, my point is this, you know, we can't, can we really, can you really call yourself Spirit-filled today? I'm asking you a question. I, I don't know the answer. Can I call myself spirit-filled? And I say, not on the basis of what I experienced when I was 11 years of, of, uh, of age. And you can't call yourself spirit-filled on the basis of when you got the baptism. Because there can have been a leakage in your life. If you haven't cultivated a relationship with the Lord, the Spirit will depart and you will become weakened as a creature of the Spirit and the flesh will begin to grow and become stronger and take over in your life. So what am I saying today? I'm saying we need a, a, a visitation of the Spirit in our lives. We need to appropriate more of the Spirit. The Spirit of God rested on Jesus, rested on him. And uh, the record in the Bible is, the Father says, he gives not the Spirit by measure to the Son. It wasn't a partial thing ever in Jesus. It was always the fullness. I'm not sure, so sure the church has always walked in the fullness. Are you? I'm not so sure I've walked in the fullness. But folks, there is the fullness available for us. Amen? This is our message today. There's higher ground available for us. Don't settle for what you got years ago, this way, that way, and so forth. And I've had some wonderful visitations, but I want to say to you this morning, I'm hungry. I'm hungry, and I'm using, I want to use the terminology, I want more of the Spirit of God and the presence of God in my life and in this church and in the church at large. We don't want an invasion of the world and its, its uh, methods and its, its, its uh, playthings and its gimmicks and all of that that are bringing leakage. Because listen, folks, when the spirit of the world comes into the church, the Holy Ghost starts to depart, begins to depart. You see that in Ezekiel. Whereas they turned to idolatry and filled the house of God with idols, the Holy Spirit, the, 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 the cloud of God's glory lifted from off the sanctuary, from the outer court, from over the mountains of the city, and disappeared. Folks, it's happened in the Pentecostal movement. It's happened in the charismatic movement. 
Well, you saw it happening in the Protestant movement, even you know, the fu fundamentalist movement, as I referred to the schools and, and the churches. But let's please uh, continue with, uh, with Isaiah chapter 11. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Wow. That's, I believe, the sevenfold Spirit of God as is referred to in the book of Revelation. And seven is the number of fullness. And surely the fullness of the Spirit rested and dwelt in the Lord Jesus. And here's the kind of person that he became in verse 3. And shall make him of quick understanding. He will have understanding in all things. He won't be dull or in the dark about anything. He won't misunderstand. He won't not understand, but he will be alive in his understanding about everything, about every situation, about even what people are thinking. He told them what they were thinking. And he shall, watch this, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, the natural eye. Neither shall he reprove after the hearing of his ears, the natural ears. He would not be a man that would live his life governed by his natural senses, such as fallen man does today, full of appetites, full of lusts, uh, the, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that kind of thing. That's the life, that's a, co a condensed description of the life of fallen man. He lives by, he lives by what, uh, the, what, what the flesh lusts after, what the eyes look after, what the ears hear about, and he lives in that realm. But he says, Jesus will not live. He will not be governed by even the natural senses. I mean, we know he never sinned. But he also lived above the realm of the natural. What the natural eye could see, what the natural ear could hear, and the emotional gamut of, uh, that, would, that would, uh, he'd be exposed to in his walk in life. But he would, be, he, would, he would live and walk in a realm above all of that. Is it possible that we can walk on terra firma and yes, yet live above it and walk above it, be above it? Nathaniel marveled at what Jesus said about him and discerning about him and all of that, but he, Jesus said, you're going to see greater things than this. He says, after this, you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Hmm. He said that would be greater. And I believe that, that refers to a man that would be in constant communion with heaven. You're going to see a man that will, will, will walk in constant communion. Praise the Lord. That's our calling. That's the possibility. That's what I'm after. And with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked and so on and so on. The ministry of Jesus is described here in, in a nutshell form. And... Uh, <clears throat> He, uh, well, you say, well, that was Jesus. Well, 
uh, I want to reinforce today that he was a pattern for us. He was a pattern. Now let's look into Luke chapter 4, please. Luke chapter 4. And stay with me now as time is going on here. But I want to unburden my heart to you. And at least today, we won't get this all covered, but at least today, begin to stir your appetite towards something that God has for you. And folks, don't count it impossible. Don't, don't conclude that this is only for Jesus. I, I can't possibly attain to this. No. He was the firstborn among many. And he wants us to arise, keep arising. This is the theme of the meeting this morning. Keep ascending to higher ground. Higher, in a practical way. Not just a theory and say, oh yeah, I believe that. No, in your walk, in your lifestyle. This week, as you walk out here in this world, that you'll find yourself walking in a higher dimension. Is that possible? Walking in a higher dimension in your mind, your thinking, your emotional uh, realm, your intellect, everything about you, your faculties. Uh, oh, how, should, how can I fit this all in here, Lord? My Lord and my God. I've, I've got to say this now while it's, all, while it's quickened before I get into Luke 4. But, uh, beloved, let, let me just, let, you know, let's review our theology today. Let's review our theology. Now I want to ask you the question, what all is the meaning of being born again? What was Jesus talking to Nicodemus about? If you look at that passage, he said, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So he said, unless you're born again, you're blind. Okay? Follow with me. And unless you're born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. So Jesus is, we know that accepting Jesus and having our sins forgiven, forgiven means the wonderful thing of having eternal life. And when in all that I say, I'm not despising that, I'm not minimizing that. That is a wonderful thing. But... <laughs> what about between the time between now and when I die? <laughs> huh? Are you just going to go around saying, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven? Well, what are you going to do between now and the time you die? Are you going to walk in the kingdom? <laughs> are you going to be a part of the kingdom? The kingdom is a dimension in the spirit. It's a spiritual dimension that Jesus walked in. And when you're born again, you receive new life. You receive a life which is Jesus Christ deposited in you that does this awesome thing. It begins to quicken your spiritual faculties. All of a sudden, once I was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace. Up until now, and up until this experience, I was in darkness. I was like a blind man, but now I see. Not just eternal life, but I see the things of God. I'm able to read the Bible and have understanding. Why? Because the, birth, the new birth has quickened that, this inner spiritual man that was once dead. Sin killed the spiritual man. Because God said to Adam, in the day that you take of that fruit, you shall die. How many of you believed he died? Did he die physically? Not immediately. <laughs> he lived almost a thousand years. But he died spiritually. He could no longer hear God or see God or live in that dimension. He was thrust out of that dimension. 
He had to be thrust out because he had no equipment to live in it. And so the new birth brings us back, hallelujah, into the kingdom. And it, whereas I was once blind, now I see. Whereas I was once deaf, I can now hear the Spirit. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that hath an ear. Some, a lot of church people don't have an ear to hear. And then the other, the, all the rest of the faculties, the heart that, that discerns the movements of the Spirit and is moved upon into certain, to act in a certain direction. That's the new birth. Hallelujah. We need to be born again and live a new life. Amen. Live a new life. Now, Jesus is the pattern. And so, uh, quickly here, the Holy Ghost, at, at John's baptism, the Holy Spirit came down and descended upon him and rested upon him, which was a sign of that which would be the experience of all believers, that we should have the Holy Ghost resting on our life or in our life. And then in, in Luke chapter 4, here's what we find. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, he was now full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> well, he was the Son of God? He didn't, did he need that? He had to go through that. He must have needed it. As a man, that was part of his development. You see, Jesus developed as you and I are, are designed to develop. Jesus needed to have the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus, now being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit. <laughs> was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Praise the Lord. How many of you would want to be a person like that? Amen? He was full of the Spirit and led by the Spirit. This is what God wants to produce in the church world. People who are full of the Spirit. Peter, full of the Holy Ghost after the day of Pentecost, spoke that awesome message, 3,000 souls. Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost brought a great uh, moment of, of uh, judgment to the nation of Israel. You, you always resist the Holy Ghost, he said to them. It's the Holy Ghost that you have to deal with. And Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know what God's going to do. But I, I believe God's going to do something if we reach out for more of the Holy Ghost. If we, can, if we can change your mentality, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's for always. That's not just when you get saved. But you and I are, are changed. We become, you know, we become spiritually mature and changed by con the continual renewing of our mind and all the doctrines, all the theology, the doctrines that prevent us from having more. Listen, man today is teaching that you get... I heard one prominent teacher say, and it irked me to no end. Sorry that it shows. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not going to mention names, but he is a prominent teacher. And he said, he said... When you get saved, you receive the Spirit, and that's all the Spirit you're ever going to get. That is not true, folks. That is not true. God has more for us, and so we need to have our minds renewed and not come into bondage to any man's theology. Amen? This is the Spirit of this church. That's why God has raised up this church in this part of, of, of 
Pennsylvania, United States, whatever. And that's why God is raising up voices all over that will not accept the perverted theology of religious systems. And beyond that, beyond that, the Pentecostal people are implying and saying that once you have the, what, what they call the baptism, which is rightly called the baptism in the spirit, you are now spirit-filled. I'm going to take a stand against that. And I'll say not necessarily. Are you with me today? Thank God for those that are with me because we're, this is new territory in a sense. This is uh, God. Listen, every time that any, any soul or a few souls gathered together have dared to go beyond the bounds of the existing order, they've come under persecution. They really have. You, you look at the pathway of the reformers, it was a battle, it was a war in order to take one step ahead in the Reformation. We'll have movies uh, shortly here, ho hopefully, to show you what some of these reformers went through for taking a stand for the revelation of greater truth. And so I say this morning, and I'm not here to say I've got it, and uh, therefore you've got to uh, you know, rise up to where I am. No, but may we be in this together that there is a place where you, you and I can be continually filled with the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. I, I don't know, I, I'm, I cannot tell you what kind of manifestations will come out of your life, but be open to anything. Be open to speaking in tongues. Be open to prophesying. Be opening, open to prayer in the Spirit. Be open to giving utterances in the Spirit. We want the Holy... The Holy Spirit needs to be the governor of the church. Amen? We need to be in the Spirit. Elizabeth was in the Spirit. She prophesied to Mary. She says, Oh, behold, the mother of my Lord is coming to me. For as soon as the voice of your salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And she goes on to prophesy, and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance. She didn't know any of this. But by the spirit of prophecy, she's prophesied by the Holy Ghost. And then Brother Wilbur said, he said, that wasn't like an explosion, that was like a geyser. But Mary got into the overflowing cup mode when she said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. You see the difference? There's a difference. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his, my handmaiden, his handmaiden, and so on. For he that is mighty hath done great things, and holy is his name. And she was in the spirit too. But she had a longer discourse it was not bombastic like, like Elizabeth's. Uh, so we can <laughs> give you something to, to uh, uh, chew over uh, in, in the future. All right, and so Jesus is the pattern son. And then in, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 14, after the temptation by the devil, the Bible says, and Jesus, <clears throat> and Jesus returned. In the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Jesus says to us in Acts 1 8, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. He returned in the power of the Spirit. Can you and I have it? You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Doesn't mean you'll always be bombastic and, 
you know, there's, again repeating, let, you know, when I first heard Brother DeVern Fromke, and I'm not here to exalt anybody, but when I first heard Brother DeVern Fromke and I had read his book, and he came to us for the first time, I think, in 19, what, 82, and um, he began to teach in such a calm mode. And he, I was always used to Pentecostal preachers that get up there and one guy, <laughs> One guy in a, in a Pentecostal church two miles from where I was raised got so wound up, and it was summertime and it was hot, and they had an open window on that side and an open window on that side, and he kept racing back and forth uh, across the front of the pulpit, uh, the platform, and he'd run over, and then he'd run back, and he'd run over, and, and he kept going closer to that window until about three-quarters of the way through his message, he jumped out the window. And where did he go? He came in the other side. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, probably in their own way, the Spirit did rest upon him. But, but uh, that was the bombastic form, you know. Oh, wow, you know. We're going to shake the pulpit. We're going to throw chairs around. And <laughs> this is all the Holy Ghost. But... Uh, <clears throat> When I first heard Devon Frompke, I thought, oh my, this man is dry. <laughs> Remember? Oh, uh, there's no anointing here. But I sat and listened. And as time went on, I was aware that there was just uh, like a cup with liquid, with the spirit being poured into my inner being, and I was getting filled up. And I, and I was feeling the anointing of God in a different way than I had ever be, done so before. And I realized, hey, the spirit of God is resting on this man just as much, if not more, on the wild Pentecostal preachers that I had heard up until that time. So we don't know. We don't know what form, how the Spirit of God is going to come. But I do believe if you seek him, how much more shall God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Isn't it interesting in that parable? Will, will a, a person help a man in the midnight hour when he's looking for bread and he's got company and, and he has nothing and yeah, he'll open, him up, up, he'll open up to him. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Spirit to those who ask him? Will you, give, will you begin to ask for more of the Spirit? I want to conclude today's word with that scene in Luke 4. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Now watch this. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in the synagogues being glorified of all. You see, at first the people received Jesus. Do you know when persecution started to come is when the leaders heard him. The Pharisaical leader, the Pharisees, the scribes, the doctors of the law, they heard him and they said, no, he, he, we can't have him. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written. <clears throat> Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me. Jesus was now anointed. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord or the year of Jubilee. And he closed the book. And there was a new order initiated that day. <laughs> Whereas for, for years they just read the scriptures, read the scriptures, and went on their way. Jesus read the scriptures. He closed the book and he gave it to the minister and he sat down and, he's, and the eyes of all of them were, that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. What's he going to do? And he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled. In your ears. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The world is awaiting for an anointed church. There's a work God wants to do. To purify us from all the garbage. That religious people have brought into the church. And to restore the flow, the pure, awesome, wonderful, powerful flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Hallelujah. And this applies not only to Methodists and Lutherans and Presbyterians, it applies to Charismatics and Pentecostals and those of us who are independent. It applies to all of us. God wants to do a new thing in our lives. Hallelujah. He will pur thoroughly purge his floor and he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Brother Tom, there's something coming. Hallelujah, folks. There's something coming. If we reach for it, if we hunger for it, if we're candidates for it. This word would be rejected in 95% of the pulpits in the land today. But praise God, Brother Jeff, he has a remnant. Amen. And deposit in Long Island, in Montrose, in Detroit, in Greenville. Hallelujah. In Africa with the grace. In India. Glory to God, he's raising up a church that's going to lay aside all the gimmicks of man and that are going to move in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Praise God. Ready. Ready.